God, we thank you tonight for being here with us. We recognize that um, it's only because of your goodness and your grace. And so, God, we say thank you. Um, Father, I pray that you'll bless every heart and mind um, that's under the sound of my voice on tonight, uh, that you'll put at ease any racing thoughts and that we can clearly hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so, God, I pray that you, we will put aside the cares of the week that is to come. Um, Lord, be with those who are on the way, and if they be, hasten their footsteps. And God, I pray for those of us who are here that you'll indeed imbue us with a special unction of your blessing. Um, prepare my heart and my mind as well as we deliver your word. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's um, go ahead to our quiz question. Is that all right? Lucifer was created with a defect in his character. Is that true or false, everyone? That is false. And I'm going to make sure that I look this way tonight while you all look that way. <laughs> uh, question number two. Satan is in the religion business to deceive as many people as he what? Is that true or false? True. Exactly. True. True. Question number three, Satan and one third of the angels in heaven were cast out because of rebellion. Is that true or false? True. That is true. That is true. And we said on, last, on the last time that we were here that one of the reasons why we need not be afraid or even worried about that, I mean, one third of, of the angelic host is indeed a lot. But what we need to be excited about is that there are still two thirds left in heaven. So whenever the, whenever the enemy sends one your way, God can send two your way to protect you and continue to carry us forward. So we want to praise God for that. Question number three, Satan is even working miracles today to deceive as many as he can. True or false, everybody? That is true. Remember, we found this in the Word of God. This is very true. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, one of the things that we find in Jesus' ministry is that uh, even those who were there in Jesus' time, they wanted miracles. They wanted that. They thought it was, it was evidence of, of his divinity. And he said, I only do these things for your sake, not for my sake, but for your sake. And so you've got to understand that if you are looking for miraculous signs and wonders and you think that that's the evidence of God's presence being somewhere, my, fr my friends, that can be used against you. Number, question number five, it has already been decided by God that Satan and his followers must die. True or false? True. True, true. That's one of the reasons why Jesus strives so much with us. Amen? Because he does not wish for any to perish. But man, if you make that choice, that's your choice to make. <clears throat> so we're going to get right into it. I want to remember one of, the things that we, um, one of the big things that we talked about in our last lesson together. I want to remember that Satan is a master deceiver. Remember we talked about that in the last lesson? He is a master deceiver. He is, he is one who has the ability and who definitely has a proudness about him to deceive, even so much as far as those who are in the presence of God. One third, as we've already talked about, the angelic host who were there in heaven, who were in perfection there, they were deceived by the enemy. Therefore, if they were deceived in heaven and deceived in that wonderful environment, what chance do we stand lest we find ourselves rooted in God's word. Amen? Amen. Got to be rooted in God's word. Therefore, I want us to be very clear tonight and as we continue to move forward that our reasoning for studying God's word is so that we are not deceived by the enemy. All right? We're not pointing fingers at anybody. and We're not saying that any one person is wrong. We want to know what thus saith the Lord says. Is that okay? Now, you're probably saying, well, where is your Bible? You keep pointing back here. I I'm a more modern guy, so I have an iPad here, just an iPad mini. So I've got everything I need right here. Amen? <clears throat> Amen. So we want to make sure that we are not deceived. And that's the reason why we are getting into God's word. All right? Okay, here we go. Ready to go to work? Tonight's lesson. Have we got it? Tonight's lesson. How many of us did tonight's lesson before we got here? Amen. Amen. All right, now. I like this, man. We got a class of learners, Sister Simons. Hungry. All right, let's go. The intro. The first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, explain to us how sin entered the world. The last three chapters of the Bible, Revelation chapters 20, 21, and 22, tell us how sin will be eradicated from the world. And all the chapters in between tells us how God related to the sin tragedy in this world. All right? God has endeavored to reconcile us back to himself since sin entered the world. However, the awful and ugly truth about sin is that sin requires a punishment. 
As a matter of fact, according to Romans chapter 6, tw verse 23, we're told that the punishment for sin is what, everybody? Death. Is death. Furthermore, Adam and Eve willfully disobeyed God. And they passed that willful disobedient gene on to all of us. All of us. Now, you know, some of us, we can just look at people and we, oh, yeah, I know exactly who you are. See it written all over your face. You're this, you're that, you're that. People, I'm a, you know, my grandmother's a crockle. Uh, my, my mother is a Hendrickson. And so people look and say, oh, when I tell them, they say, oh, I can see the crockles. You've got the high cheekbones like the crockle men. And, you know, we can look at one another and know things about each other's family based off of our genetic code. Yes, amen, just by the things that we look at. Well, it's the same thing with sin. Adam and Eve handed this thing down to us. And the great tragedy of the sin problem is that we deserve to die because of sin. Now, see, so watch this. God does not desire for us to die. So God is caught in a dilemma at the very beginning of time. He's caught in a dilemma. And his dilemma is very simply this. He can either excuse sin. He can excuse sin altogether. Or he can tolerate it and let us die. But neither option is appealing to God. Why? Because God does not wish for any of us to die. And so here's what he does. According to our lesson, he makes a gamble of epic and cosmic proportions by sending his only begotten son to die on the cross for us and become our payment for sin. And because he has become our payment for sin, he realized we now have a way of escape from the sin problem. As a matter of fact, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, calls this plan the everlasting gospel. That is God's good news, that he had a plan in place so that we can have salvation today. With that being in mind and that being the case today, we're going to explore, we're going to explore a couple questions. Question number one that we're going to explore. What must I do to benefit from the awesome sacrifice of God's son? Now, if someone makes a sacrifice on your behalf, you want to know what you can do to benefit from it. Amen? So what must I do to benefit from the awesome sacrifice of God's son? Number two, how can I know he accepts me? How can I know he accepts me? Hendrickson, you just told me that in my genetic code is this thing called sin, and it's messed me up. So how can I know that he accepts me? We're going to discover that through this lesson tonight. Number three, how can I strengthen my weak faith? How can I strengthen my weak faith? And number four, what is Revelation's good news for me? What is Revelation's good news for me? You ready? Let's go to work. Let's go to work. Question number one, what is God's plan to save his people called in Revelation? Well, we just found that out. What is it, everybody? The everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. Question number two, when did the plan to save man go into effect according to Revelation chapter 13, verse 8? When was it, everybody? At the foundation of the world. Listen, I don't mind you yelling out to me. It's fine. You, you, you can yell out to me. I'm, I'm good like that. You can, you can yell out to me. I only repeat it for the camera's sake. Amen? <laughs> At the foundation of the world. Question number three. What happened when Adam sinned and why? According to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. What happened when Adam sinned and why? Well, according to Re Romans chapter 5, verse 12, what happened? Yeah. Death passed upon some men, a few men, all men, all men. Now, what we've got to understand in the context of our two questions, question two and question three, that all who have ever been saved since the fall have all been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Everyone has. It's nothing, you know the old song, I know it was the blood, I know it was the blood that saved me. The blood is what has saved everyone. Even in the Old Testament, it's the symbolic nature of the sacrificial system which pointed to the cross. Once Jesus comes down, we no longer need to, to sacrifice any sort of animal. But it's the faith in that system that allows it to work for them. In other words, brothers and sisters and friends of mine, family, what we must understand is that we must have faith in God's sacrifice through his son in order for this thing to work. If I don't have faith in it, 
uh, then it's just simply something that we talk about. And we must have faith in the plan of salvation for the plan to become a reality in our lives. Furthermore, what the Bible makes very clear to all of us is that we have all sinned. We've all sinned. We've all sinned. We've all sinned. Amen. We've all sinned. Yes, yes. Nobody is exempted from it. We're all guilty as a result of it. And because of it, we all need help from it. Are you with me tonight? Amen. Question number four. Oh, well, why? Because we've all sinned. We know that. Question number four. Why is living a life of sin such a serious matter? Why is living a life of sin such a serious matter? Well, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, why is it, everybody? Because the wages is what? Is death, exactly. Because the wages of sin is death. In other words, we have earned death as a result of our sin problem. And as a result of our sin problem, we deserve death. And you've got to understand something, brothers and sisters, that this is truly our sin problem. It's not just your mother's sin problem. It's not your father's sin problem. It's not your spouse's sin problem. or your, All of us. It's our sin problem. And why am I stressing the fact that it's our sin problem? Because we must understand, or, or rather, when I make this thing personal to me, then I realize, Sister Simons, that I need a personal Savior to help me. Because sometimes we can get so high and mighty on our own. <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I'm so glad. It's, it's like the man standing there saying, I'm so glad I'm not like the tax collector. I'm so glad I'm not like the drunkard. I'm so glad I'm not like this. And we can get so high on our quote unquote goodness that we forget that we're in need of a savior. We all need a Savior because we all have a sin problem. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Question number five, what does sin do to our relationship with God? What does sin do to our relationship with God? Can we look that up real quick? Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. Page 1095. Isaiah Chapter 59, verse 2, and camera folk, I'm trying to do my best to stay <laughs> and to look. What does it say, everybody? But your what? But your iniquities have done what? Between and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not. So what has sin done to our relationship with God? It separates us from God. It separates us from God. And as a result of us being separate from God, God needed a way to bridge the gap. And I'm so glad that he bridged the gap with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Question number six, what did Jesus' death do for his people? What did Jesus' death do for his people? Well, according to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So what did Jesus' death do for his people? It did what? Wash them or, wa yeah, you said it right, washed us. Come on now, washed us. I know, the book, I know the lesson says them, but man, I'm claiming the fact that we're all considered or we're all been grafted into the body of Christ, amen? So it washed us from my, you know, when I was doing this thing, I made it personal. It washed me from my sin. Washed me from my sin. I know it washed us, Elder Derek, but it washed me from my sin. And you ought to be thankful that you've got a Savior that personally and, and intimately is concerned about your salvation. It's concerned about your salvation. As a matter of fact, according to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, my little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have what, everybody? An advocate 
with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation. In other words, he's the payment for our sins and not just for ours, but also the whole world. That's important, beloved, for you to understand because what the Bible is telling us here is that there is not just a special group that Jesus came down on this earth to die for. Jesus came to this earth to die for everyone. Everyone has an opportunity to accept the gift of salvation because Jesus came to this earth for everyone. Everybody. Doesn't matter what social standing you are, and it doesn't matter what cultural standing you are. Red and yellow, remember the old song, red and yellow, black and white? They're all precious in his sight. Jesus died for everyone, from the guttermost to the uttermost. Jesus died for everyone. That's why, friends of mine, we ought to treat people in the way that God values people. Treat people the way God values people. And God valued each and every one of us, or not even just us, but everybody on this island. He valued them at such high cost in that he sent his only begotten son to die for them, die for us. I don't understand that this this evening. Jesus died for everybody. Jesus died for everybody. Number seven, upon whom have my sins and my death penalty been placed? According to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So who? Jesus. Jesus. You know, I would challenge you just to, uh, in your own time, just to look at Isaiah chapter 53. Look at it. Read that chapter. Because what's so amazing to me, Elder Francis, is that it describes what the Son of God was going to have to go through in such gruesome detail. He knew he was going to have to suffer and die, but yet that did not deter him from coming to this earth. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that in spite, and listen, I don't like pain in any way, shape, or form. It, truth be told, I mean, it may not seem like it, but like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a sissy when it concerns certain things. I don't like needles. Don't like needles, don't like the sight of them, anything like that, nothing. I just, you know, man, if I could avoid a fight when I was young, I avoided it. I count on one hand how many times I got in a fight, man. God gave me the gift of gab, so I'd gab myself right out of it. <laughs> don't like pain. And I don't like pain on my own account. I surely am going to take it on your account. But here is the Son of God. Knew what he was going to have to endure for us. But he came anyway. Came anyway. Knew that folks were going to turn their back on him. But he came anyway knew that folks were going to lie on him, but he came anyway. Knew that folks or someone close to him was going to betray him, but he came anyway. Came anyway. And he came anyway because he knew that in 2014 there were going to be some people in the island of Bermuda that were going to know, that were going to need to hear the good news that Jesus saved from the uttermost to the guttermost because he loves each and every one of us. Loves us with an everlasting love. Number eight, why was God willing to give his son for us, and why was Jesus willing to die? Well, we've talked about this already. John 3, 16, we know that. What does that say, everybody? John 3, 16, for God so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not but have a man. So we know that he did this. Why, everybody? Because of their great love for us, unconditional, undeserved, unconstrained, unmerited, we can never do enough to earn, can't earn it. 
You know, there was a, a, a movie in the 80s, it was entitled Can't Buy Me Love. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. It's entitled Can't Buy Me Love. You had a little hook to it, Can't Buy Me Love. Yeah, yeah, some of y'all, see, I, I just mess you all up. Come back, come back, come back, come back. Somebody said, oh yeah, I love that movie. Come back. <laughs> But the whole premise about it was this kid who, who, who thought he could buy his way into the cool crowd or, or buy the love of, of the popular cheerleader. And, and so he tried his best to buy uh, the love, but, but realized by the end of the movie that, that you can't buy love. And so true, we've got to understand that when we get later on into our seminar and even into tonight, we do things because we love God, not to earn his love. Are you with me tonight? You're going to find that Christ is very clear. If you love me, this is what you do. Yes. Not, not do these things to prove you love me or do these things to earn my love, but it must come out of, I, 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 I nurture my relationship with God because I love him. I'm obedient to his word because I love him. And I don't do it the other way. I don't try to be obedient so I can earn his love. You've got God's love already. He sent his son to die for you. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us there's no greater love than that, that a man lays down his life for his friend. It goes on to tell us that while we were yet still, Christ died for us. I love what one modern translation says in that, in that passage of Scripture. The one modern translation says that while we were yet still his enemies, Christ died for us. Powerful, powerful thought that while we were yet still his enemies, Christ died. Lay down his life for us. You can't earn his love. He's just giving that thing freely. Amen? <clears throat> Number nine, what must I do to benefit from Jesus' sacrifice? What must I do to benefit from Jesus' sacrifice? Well, it says very clearly what, everybody? Believe on the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Number ten, how may I receive forgiveness and cleansing? How may I receive forgiveness and cleansing? What is that, everybody? Man, this is a sharp group, Sister Simons. Sharp group. I know that we're going to have perfect attendance, Elder Onesimus, all the way. You're going to have a problem with those iPad minis. I tell you that right now. <clears throat> Claiming it. Yes, amen. Just keep occupying that seat and it'll be yours. Confess my sins. <laughs> Confess my sins. Please understand, beloved. Please understand that how do I receive forgiveness and cleansing? By confessing my sins. That is just the start. Proverbs 28 verse 13 lets me know that I must turn away from my work of sin as well. See, it's one thing to confess, but I got to stop doing what I was doing. And we're going to get into that really quickly here in the, next, in the next couple of questions. But, man, let me just say this, that, that you can't confess on the one hand and then keep living the same old, same old. You can't do it. You can't do it. And we're going to see why. Not because Hendrickson or Manders are saying it, but because the Word of God clearly makes that plain. Uh, number 11, what does the Bible say must accompany repentance? What does the Bible say must accompany repentance? What does it say, everybody? Conversion. And according to Acts chapter 3, verse 19, repent therefore and be what? Converted that your sins may be when the times of refreshing shall come and the pres come from the presence of the Lord. Working together, excuse me, let me say here, working together, repentance and conversion imply a change of behavior. Because I've got a new inner working in my life. I've got a new inner motive. Therefore, I want to be different. As a matter of fact, when, when you look at the original language, repentance means to cha a change of mind. And conversion or being converted means to turn around. So do you understand how these two work together? I can't repent or I can't change my mind in Christ and then not change my way in Christ. As a matter of fact, the implication about convert isn't just to turn around. It's to make a U-turn. Now, you know, we know this. If you're going the wrong direction, we love to travel, amen. Bermudians love trips. May not be able to take as many of them as we once used to in this economy, but we still, we'll still find a way to squeeze a trip in a year. Come on now. Testify. Amen. Testify. Amen. <laughs> we'll find a way. We'll find a way. 
And you know every so often you, you may go to some place that you're not familiar with, and if you're going the wrong way, if you're on the highway and by, if you missed your exit, the only way to go, back, to go back the way in which you came is to make a U-turn. It's not like Bermuda where you can sort of go all the way down and, you know, it's only, no, man, if you keep going one way, you'll mess around and find yourself in the wrong state. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, oh, my goodness, we were just traveling for three hours, and <laughs> you've got to make a U-turn. And it's the same thing in life, beloved. When you repent, when you change your mind, when you hear the word of God and the spirit of God impresses you that things must be different in your life. The repentance is one part. You accept and say, yes, it's got to be different. But once I am converted, I got to turn around. And the reason why is much like traveling in the United States, that if I change my mind but don't change my way, I'm going to find myself in a very different state. Got to change. There's got to be some difference in me. People have to see the difference in me. Can't. I said this the other night. You can't claim to be serving God and love God and be the same nasty, unhappy, grouchy person that you were before Christ. If for nothing else, it's a horrible witness of the love of Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen anybody stand up and say, Jesus loves you, and been convinced that Jesus loves you? <laughs> oh, let's, bring it, let's, let's make it even more personal. If your spouse looks at you and says, baby, I love you, are you believing that? <laughs> I know some of you, man, you, you, you have to reset. <laughs> Go take five minutes and come back. <laughs> You've got to turn around got to change. My mind may be made up differently, but I've also got to change the way I act. Got to. Change the way I act. I'm staying here for a minute because many times folks don't have a problem with repentance, Sister Simons. They don't mind changing their minds, but when it comes out on this, it's to changing the way I behave. Oh, that's a horse of a different color. Real different. And the reason why I've got, you, got us to understand that tonight is because, as, as I like to say in my own, to my own congregation, we're all still here. We're all still here. So I don't care how long you have been, been in the Lord, we're all still here. I don't care how nice you think you are and everybody tells you you are, we're all still here. So there's still some directional change that must need to take place in me. Amen. Not only do I need to repent, Amen. but I also need to change my ways. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number 12, what is this conversion experience called in Scripture and why? According to John 3, verses 3 through 7, this is called what, everybody? New birth or being born again. Amen. Number, yeah, because when we are born again, we have what, everybody? No past. No past. No past. Number 13. Number 13. Who comes into my life at conversion? Who comes into my life at conversion? According to the word of God, who does? Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, four things happen to us at the moment of conversion. Four things. First thing is that Jesus Christ comes into our lives. Amen. According to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Man, there is nothing more special, if you would, or more personal than in that culture than to sup with someone. You've got to understand that, that in the culture in which this is being written, to invite someone in your home to eat with them is a very intimate and personal. Isn't that still the same today? You don't just invite anybody over your house to eat. You just don't, amen? No, no. And understand that the context in which Christ is talking about, in which this is talked about here, this is not sort of a potluck, a group gathering. This is a one-on-one -on -one experience. Jesus says, if you hear me knocking and you open the door, man, I want to eat with you. I want to have a personal conversation with you. That's intimate, y'all. That's personal. I mean, I love that. That's the kind of imagery that Christ has. So number one, Jesus comes into our lives. Number two, 
God freely forgives our sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful in what, everybody? Just to do what? Forgive us of our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So not only will Jesus come into our lives, and not only will God freely forgive our sins, but number three, God accounts to us the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might have the righteousness of God. I mean, not only is he paying the penalty for us, but he's also covering you. with his righteousness. In other words, when God the Father looks at you once you've accepted this gift, he doesn't just see Kathy anymore. He sees the righteousness of his son hovering over you. Jesus comes into our lives. God fully forgives our sins. He accounts the righteousness of God to him, to us. Number four, God accepts us and treats us as his children. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knows, knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he. I mean, that's an awesome promise, y'all. It's really an awesome promise of what God wants to do for us once we allow him, allow him to do these things for us. Amen? Question number 14, through what agency does Jesus abide in my life? According to John chapter 14, verse 17, what agency is that, everybody? What is that, everybody? The Holy Spirit, amen. Question number 15, when Jesus abides in my life through his Holy Spirit, what two marvelous things does he do for me? Now, beloved, remember, elder, Elder Onesimus talked about gifts that he wanted to give us for being a part of this beautiful seminar. And those are excellent gifts, wonderful gifts. Notice what we found out here in this word. Once we accept God's free gift, he does... <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Elder Francis, you're right. Once we accept his free gift, he gives us more gifts. I mean, you've heard the saying, the gift that keeps on giving, that's what Jesus is, the gift that keeps on giving. And so while we've talked about the four things he'll do for us, now we find out that once we allow the Holy Spirit to abide in us, he does some other things as well. What does he do, everybody? Both to will and to do his good pleasure. Both to will and to do his good pleasure. In other words, Jesus gives me a willing heart to want to do the things of God, and then he'll give me the power to do those things. Because he recognizes that I'm born in sin, I'm shaped in iniquity, on my own, my righteousness is as filthy rags, I can't do this thing by myself. So here's what he says. He says, listen, don't you worry about it, Sister Lynette. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put inside of you a desire to want to live right. But also, I'm going to give you the power to do right. So not only am I going to give you, see, if you accept me then, I recognize that you've had just generations upon generations. See, it's not just your mess you've got to be dealing with. I've got some generational stuff that's on me as well, stuff that, that my father or my mother or their father and their mother did that, that has been handed down to me that's in my, that's in my DNA that, that, that I cannot decode on my own. But here comes Jesus saying, just accept me and I'll rewrite your DNA. I'll make you, trans I'll transform you. I'll make you brand new. Jesus Christ, 
Jesus Christ. And now I love what he says in, uh, in, this, in this question here. Why should I be confident, relieved, and excited once I have experienced a new birth according to uh, Jude and Philippians? Well, here's what the answer is. He which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If that doesn't make you say amen and hallelujah, it should. Because here's what he's saying. Not only will I start the work, not only will I sustain the work, but I'll also finish the work. Man, sometimes you go around the island and you'll see folks building. You'll see folks building. And sometimes they don't get to finish because building costs a lot of money. And in this economic downturn, we don't have the access to the same funds that we once did. And so you'll see houses that have stayed the same, half finished, half done for years because folks have run out of resources. But here's Jesus saying, I will not only put it inside of you, but I'll continue to maintain it, and I'm going to give you the resource to see it through till the end. See, if you've built a house, and you can appreciate that because you know how much of a drain it was on your finances. If you own a house, you can appreciate that because you know how much of a drain it is on your finances even to maintain it. But here comes Jesus now, and even if you're renting a house, you know how much of a drain that is on your finances. Here comes Jesus. My God, he says, I've gone to prepare a place to you for you, and I will come again to receive you unto myself. Now, in the interim, while I'm building you a house, I'm also going to give you the power I'm also going to give you the resource to make it through this thing called life. You ain't got to worry. I got you. You ain't got to worry. I'm taking care of you. You don't have to worry. I brought you to this point. I love what one preacher says. If God has brought you to it, he'll be faithful and just to carry you through it. Exciting to me. I get excited about these things. Because it's exciting to me to know and even to remind myself that, man, sometimes you just need to encourage yourself in the, in the promises of God. You need to pro- encourage yourself. You may have heard these things for years upon years, but sometimes, man, just hearing them again encourages your heart, encourages your mind. Just to let you know that, that this is God. God begun this thing inside of me. So I've got to believe that even if, see, you know how that changes your perspective even on life? Even if God has brought me to a storm and I feel like I'm being, the willows are blowing, I'm taking blows this way and blows that way, we've got to remember he which begun a good work work in you. As difficult as it may seem right now, the work that God is trying to do inside of you is a good work. It's good work. Not only will he, not only has he started in you, but he's going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What is the big problem that faces many Christians today? What is the big problem that faces many Christians today? Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, eager to call him Lord. Here you go. Refuse. Now remember, I told you we get to this. I told you we get this, so just say ouch. Just say ouch. No one has a problem with Jesus being our Savior. As a matter of fact, if you went around churches on today, on this entire, and this entire weekend, Palm Sunday, ran packed. Because no one has a problem with Jesus being Savior. As a matter of fact, we've made a whole holiday, Easter, around celebrating his resurrection and him being Savior. We've done that, Amen. Because no one has a problem with Jesus being Savior. But remember now, it's a twofold thing. Savior and Lord. Savior has saved me. Lord says. (laughs) Savior, we can celebrate the Savior. And we ought to celebrate the Savior. But when he starts to take lordship over our lives, there are some things that I used to do I just can't do anymore because he's Lord. There are some things I 
there are some ways I used to behave that I just can't behave that way anymore because he's... There are some actions that I used to do that I just can't do anymore because he's... And brothers and sisters of my, and friends of mine, there are even some beliefs that I used to hold on to that I just can't hold on to anymore because he's... How difficult is it sometimes for me to let the Lord lead me where he knows I should go? What does the Bible let us know? That it's as hard as what, everybody? Plucking out an eye or cutting off hand, arm, limb, any part of your body. You know, most, most uh, psychologists and clinical sociologists will tell you that m anyone who does physical harm to themselves is because there's something wrong up here. Because we're not wired to harm ourselves. We're just not wired that way. Something has to seriously go wrong up here for you to, you know. It, it, it just, that's the way it goes. Because we're not wired that way. Christ didn't make us that way. That's why he says that for some of us, to accept Jesus Christ as Lord is as hard as plucking out an eye or cutting off a limb. Because truth be told, as a result of the sin problem, remember now, remember we said, I believe it was on, on, on the last night we were, we were here together, that we are innately, we are innately born with, with the desire to worship. We'll worship something. But we've also got to remember that as a result of Adam and Eve's decision, we're also innately born to rebel against Christ. So on the one hand, you have this desire to want to worship something, but on the other hand, you have this desire to rebel. And as a result of this desire to rebel, that's why it's so difficult for us, and that's why he says the Holy Spirit must abide in us. Christ knows, man, if we're left to do this thing on our own, it's not going to happen. It's not. Exactly, brother. You're going to fail every time. That's why he says what the promise is, that I've begun the work, and I'll continue to perform the work until I return. Because he knows if, if, if Hendrickson is left up to himself to try to do this thing on his own, Hendrickson, because he is bred and he is genetically mapped to rebel against me, ain't going to make it. I'd accept that. Number 19, why is it absolutely imperative for me to crown Jesus as Lord? Lord? Why is that, everybody? So he can do what, everybody? Restore his image in me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Beloved, it's not enough to be born again. Being born again is just the first part of the process. And just like we all were born, but we didn't stay babes, we grew. We grew up, amen? amen. Christ, too, expects us, once we're born again, to grow and grow and grow. You know, they'll read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll do what, everybody? Grow, grow, grow. grow, grow. And then the, other, the flip side of it was um, forget your Bible, forget to pray, and you do what? Shrink, 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 shrink. And we learn that song, whether, we learn that song, and yet it's so fundamentally true, and we applaud our children for singing it. Oh, it's so cute. And then we get older and we wonder, well, why is my face so weak? Why can't I hear the voice of God or, or know what his will is for my life? Read your Bible. Pray every day. And you'll grow. Grow, grow. Christ expects us to grow. And in order for his image to be restored in us, we have to grow. Um, it's a beautiful thing. I'm, I've told you before, I'm, I'm, just a I'm just recently a father. My son goes three um, on next month. And it's been a beautiful thing just to see him grow into his features. I'm looking back sort of three years later at, at this, you know, when he first came out, he, he's 10 pounds. So he's a big boy. Yeah, he's a big boy. He's a big boy. 
We make them big. I know I don't look like it, but we make them big. <laughs> I know I don't look like it, but we make them big. He came out and he, he looked, looked like a little sumo wrestler. His eyes were closed. I mean, he was, he, he was so big that they, they actually had to um, feed him some milk right away um, while my wife was in post-op because his blood sugar count, they were afraid it was too low. So he's a, a greedy little, you know, just greedy little boy. But, but it's been amazing to just look at the pictures and see his features and see him grow from, from being a newborn where you're like, well, who does he look like? To now, you know, having people say, well, oh, he looks like, you know, he looks like you from here to here and he looks like his mother from here to you know. It's a beautiful, but that only happens when you grow. And the only way the image of God can be restored in us is if we grow. Gotta grow. Gotta grow. As a matter of fact, I love what Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says. We are seeing, we're seeing we are also encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our, man, and I've already said this thing, man, but I just want us to really understand that Jesus is the one who started our story. He's the one who started our story. So let him be the one to write your story. And let him be the one to complete your story. You know, some of us are like half-written books. Half-read books. You know, I, I have a terrible problem because I, I don't really finish books. I've got a bunch of books on my iPad that are just halfway done. I like reading them. Like, I, get, I get bored. I get bored. So, you know, they're, they're just halfway finished. I've got like a bunch of books that are halfway done. And I believe that for many of us, you're like my books in my iPad. Christ has gotten to a certain point, and we're not finished yet. We're not finished. But the beauty of our book is that when we read his book, we know how we're going to look when we're finished. So we just have to let him write the chapters in the middle that make up the body. Come on and say amen, somebody. I know that if I stick with this thing, he's coming back again for me. I know that if I stick with this thing, he's giving me a crown of glory. I know if I stick with this thing, he's got a white for me. I know if I stick with this thing, I'll be on the sea of glass. I know if I stick with this thing, I will reign with him in heaven. I know if I stick with this thing, God has something greater than anything this world can offer me in store for me. I just got to stick with this thing and let him, let him, let him, let him write the book. Amen. Amen. Number 20, how can we know that Jesus has accepted us when we ask? Remember, we want to know these things. How can we know that Jesus has accepted us when we ask? Well, here's what we said. Because he did what, everybody? He promised, he promised it and what? And he cannot lie. He promised it and he cannot lie. So you've got to have faith in that thing. Remember we talked about this earlier on in the lesson tonight? We've got to have faith. Just in the same way that the Old Testament brethren had faith in this thing, we've got to have faith in the promises of God. If I don't have faith, then the Bible says it is what? Impossible. Impossible. You can't. You know, it'd be a crying shame just to sit around and, and, and go through the motions of this thing called Christianity and not really believe in it and then get to the judgment and find out, man, that because I didn't have faith, got to have faith. Got to have faith. Number 21, I know my time is short. How may I strengthen my faith? Remember we talked about that. How may I strengthen my faith? Study the Word of God. Study the Word of God. I love these passages of Scripture. Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word have I done what, everybody? Amen. Hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But he answered and said unto them, It is written, Man shall not live by what? Amen. Bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by study the word of God, everyone. This is how you strengthen your faith. 
through faithful study of God's Word. And I want you to be sure tonight and understand this evening that one of the main reasons why we are having this seminar is so that your faith can be strengthened. I want your faith to be strengthened. I want you to leave here walking every night with a little bit more upright and a little bit more spiritual backbone because you know what God's Word says. How will true conversion change my life? How will true conversion change my life? Well, first thing, begins to love everybody. See, when I'm truly converted, man, I'll even love those folks who hate me. Woo! Hanging on a cross, mocked and ridiculed and jeered, spat on. What does he say? Forgive them, Father, <laughs> for they know not what they do. You know, I was studying this thing because we're in that time of season, and I was studying this thing, and I was saying to myself, you know one of the most amazing things about the cross is that in the midst of everyone saying something negative to Jesus, he doesn't say anything. <laughs> I said, Lord, help me <laughs> to be like you. <laughs> because I know if someone is saying something to me, and I know it's wrong, I'm going to open up my mouth. I may have something, man, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm not there yet. He, he's still working on me, y'all. He's still working on me. He's still working on me. Every so often my mouth gets me in trouble. Every so often my, my, my tongue gets me in trouble because I, I just speak back. Oh, man, you may not say the wrong thing to Hendrickson at the wrong time. I may say something wrong back to you and then come out to apologize to you later. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but listen, when God begins to work on me, I'll begin to love everybody. The second thing, not only will I begin to love everybody, but my lifestyle will be what, everybody? Will be different. First John, oh no, my lifestyle will be different. I've got to understand this thing, man. Remember we said this already, that I can repent, I can change my mind, but once I'm converted, I've got to change the way I act. Got to be different. People ought, you ought to see something different about me. They ought to see something different. It's not that any man can boast in their own good work, but my Lord, if you say that Jesus Christ is inside of your heart, then please, the character of Christ should become manifest inside of me on the inside and gradually work its way out. Now, I know some of us, on the inside is some tough work there. <laughs> Come on and testify, on the inside there's some tough work there. It's some tough work there. Has some hard years rolling with the devil. There's some tough work there. But it's still a work that needs to be done. And eventually, somebody should be able to recognize, hey, wait a minute, you aren't acting the same you used to. It's because I got hooked up with Jesus. My lifestyle should be different. Secondly, I will be willing to do what? Keep his. And I will want to? Yeah. And we said no one has a problem with him being Lord. Excuse me, no one has a problem with him being Savior. But we got a problem with him being Lord. This is what the Bible says. I want you to understand that this isn't Hendrickson or Manders. Simon's or anybody else. This is what the Word of God says. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And this is for those who believe that the commandments were done away with at the cross. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. This is what the Word of God says. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his what? Commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Please do not be fooled by those translations that may have uh, keep his word. The original language there is commandments. Keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. And this is well after the cross, even after the cross, for those that love Jesus Christ, commandment keeping is part of what God expects of those who say, I love you. I will... I will begin to know what God's will is for me. Wandering around aimlessly in life, some of us, not knowing direction, up from down, left or right, spin around in circles, it seems like. Spend some time inside of God's word and you'll begin to find purpose. You'll begin to find direction. You'll begin to find uh, just a, a, a balance in your life. I'll begin to know because I'll begin to know God's will for my life. Next one, I will want to tell others what great things the Lord has done for me. Now see, I'm not going to go through all this mess down here and then serve God and be the biggest fool before God and then once God comes in my life, I shut my mouth. No, 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 no. 
If I was going hard before I knew Christ and acting the fool before I knew Christ, now that I'm hooked up with Jesus, I've got to go even harder because I can look back on the foolishness I used to do and say, thank you, God, that you kept me, you preserved me from all that mess. So I got to be willing to tell somebody. Got to be willing to tell everybody about what God has done for me. See, if I was walking around this island, man, you knew me to be the biggest drug boy, dope boy in the world, and I get hooked up with Jesus, then once I'm hooked up with Jesus, everybody's going to know that I'm hooked up with Jesus. If I had a reputation in this island for being the nasty, mo nastiest, most cuss-filled person in the world, then once I get hooked up with Jesus, you're going to know that there's nothing but a song in my heart and praise on my lips. People got to know. What does the song say? Hide it under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine. Got to let people know. I will want to spend time talking to God in prayer. True conversion takes over my life. I'll be more willing, I'll be more loving to all whom I come in contact with. I want to be obedient to everything that God says, and I want to allow him to govern my life. I want to spend time with him. And the word of God says Enoch got so deep with him that he walked with him. What's that hymn say? And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me. Come on, we know that. I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry none other has ever known. That, that's, that's our testimony with Jesus Christ. That once I get hooked up with him, it just becomes sweeter. And each day is sweeter than the next. What is Jesus' provision to save sinners called according to Romans chapter three, Romans, excuse me, chapter six, verse 23? A gift, a gift. Now listen, man, when someone gives you a gift, you take it, it becomes yours. We've just got to take that gift and it'll become ours. 24, the Bible is clear that most people will be what? I mean, that's a sobering thing. Since Jesus' love, loving provision for sinners is a free gift, why will so many be lost? If, if someone's giving you a free gift, if I told you all right now, man, that, man, there's a million dollars waiting down there for the first 10 or 16 people that come down there, man, you all are right. <laughs> Hendrickson, I'll see you later. I'm gone. <laughs> right now. At this moment, you, you down the hill. You at, you at. Here's Jesus saying, I've got eternity waiting for everybody. But there's still going to be some loss. Why? If you be willing and you shall eat the good of, but if you, but if you, but if you and you shall be, you shall be devoured with the sword. Ball's in our court, y'all. See, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Just give me a few more minutes of your time. I'm almost done. Y'all know that, too, because you got the lesson right in front of you. You know they're like, man, he's not, he's not just a preacher talking. He's only got two questions left. It's crazy, the ball was in our court. And this is why it's, it's such a cosmic gamble, everybody. Because the very thing that brought sin into this world, free will, is the very thing God is banking on that once you see the two, yeah, you'll make a choice. The choice is yours. But you've got to be willing, and you've got to be obedient. Yes. He has to be Savior, and he also has to be Lord. Amen. Watch this. We're almost done. What five grand and glorious truths does Revelation tell us about the incredible good news of Jesus' plan to save his people? See, although there's going to be some that are lost, man, I'm not going to focus on the folks that are lost. I want to focus on y'all people that want to be saved. Amen? Amen? So there are some glorious truths in the book of Revelation. The first one, Jesus is what? Alive. Alive forevermore. The second one is what, everybody? He has what? The keys. the keys to unlock what? Hell and, death. 
hell, and death. In other words, man, here's what he says. Good news. Jesus is a living Savior who has power over... Come on now. I serve a what? He's in what? I know that he is living what? No matter what man may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice to cheer. At just the time I need him, he's what? We know this hymn. He's always there. What is it? He lives. He lives, man. He lives. Buddha, dead. Confucius, dead. Muhammad, dead. Any one of the popes? Dead. And if they're not dead, they're on their way out the door. <laughs> but here's Jesus, still alive forevermore. My Savior, our Redeemer, he's alive. Not only does he have the keys, but he was slain to do what? Redeem, redeem us to God. Slain to redeem us to God. Good news, his sacrifice was for you and me personally. Not only that, but he gives us what? White raiment, boy. You all like a little, you like a little, little outfit. I don't know about you, but I do. I like a new outfit. When I get to heaven, I'm putting on a white raiment. Good news, Jesus' righteousness, the white raiment, is a gift. I do not earn it. Jesus, by, Jesus has given it to us, and he provides it for free. The gospel will go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. I love what the lesson says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. What am I saying? That the word of God will travel to everyone. Good news. Good news. Jesus will not overlook one single person everywhere. Every one of us is extremely important to him. See, if someone's lost, Jesus is not going to say it's because you didn't come by, I didn't come by your house. No, he says, I'm knocking at your door. If you open it, I'm going to come and personally sup with you. Good news. If I thirst for him, he will give of me the fountain of water of life freely. Good news. Jesus' part in salvation is to furnish the power, miracles, love, forgiveness, and grace. My part is to truly desire or thirst for him to save me. Somewhere else in the Bible I heard of hunger and thirsting after righteousness. It's unthinkable that any of us present at this seminar would fail to accept Jesus' miraculous free offer to forgive and cleanse us and restore us to his image. Jesus is anxious to work miracles for all of us. Will you just now, at this moment, decide to accept his plan to save you or reaffirm that great decision? You can write that down on your lesson. My prayer is that you'll say yes. Yes. yes.